Good morning, LifePoint Crossing. So glad that you are here. Welcome back to the dramatic conclusion of how not to have a conversation. I hope it's been good. I hope it's been fun. I hope it's been, you know, some maybe a little less threatening to sometimes you can see what to do by looking at what not to do. And so I think it's been good. Um, but here is a very, very small, but very, very, it's actually not very small. It's, that's the exact wrong thing to say. It's a very, very big, but very, very simple piece of biblical theology to start with. We live in a fallen world. This is the world where things go wrong. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Sin came into the world and all of its consequences with it. And the best news in history is that Jesus came and lived and died and resurrected so that we could be reconciled to our holy and just creator God. But the bad news is that all has not yet been consummated and made right. And so this is still the world we live in where things go wrong. And if we made a list of things that could go wrong, that list would reach to the heavens. But the most important place and the place that we can make the most progress is with ourselves, right? With you and me, or for me, specifically me, but for you, that'll be a little bit different. And so here's the reality is sometimes things go wrong and it's on us. Like sometimes it's my fault. Sometimes I'm the problem, or at least a part of the problem. And so we are all here, like, and it's so easy, right? We all say things like, well, you know what? I'm only human, and everybody understands that. Everybody understands that to be human, that's basically synonymous with, you know what? Sometimes I do things that are wrong. And especially if you're here as a follower of Jesus, of course, that's the very entry point to following Jesus is recognizing that uh, we have sinfulness, and so that's why we come to him. But sometimes this is a reality, and it's on us. And so if you have been having a conversation yesterday or 20 years ago or whenever it was and things went a little bit sideways, sometimes it's us, okay? Or at least a part of it for sure is us. And so something that that is inevitably going to lead to sometimes then is there may be need for an apology. And wow, has our world given us so many examples of how not to apologize. And what does the Bible have to say about apologies? Well, I, I think maybe nothing exactly directly, but if you kind of look around the edges, really some very, very big and important things. Just for one, I think this is kind of amazing, is here's what Jesus says to do when somebody has something against you, right? If you've wronged somebody, here's what he says to do, how to handle it. He says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember, see, look at that, that someone has something against you, leave. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. It doesn't specifically use the word apologize, but to be reconciled to someone who has something against you, I think that pretty well necessitates that an apology is probably going to be at least a part of that. And he even puts that, you can see that, in the context of you're there literally worshiping God. And you know what? It's, it's not, I don't know necessarily that that's less important, but God will be there. He's not going anywhere. Go be reconciled to that person. This is so important. Here's a very, very simple but widely applicable verse from Romans 12, 18. It says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. I think this is so good on a couple different levels. For one, it's so big. It's all and every. What should I do? All that you can. Like, so does that include, yes, this is every, all that you can. Who, to whom does that extend? Everyone. All that you can. Everyone. And so that's so big. That covers anything you can think of. It almost seems a little bit idealistic, except for then it is also at the same time so realistic as to acknowledge and recognize that really you are still only responsible, however, for one part of any relationship. You're only responsible for yourself. You're not responsible for somebody else. So it says, well, do all that, that you can. Actually, the translation that I grew up with, the, the NIV, it says, uh, as much as it depends on you, 
live at peace with everyone. And so sometimes it recognizes that there may be someone who is just not going to be willing to live at peace with you, but if you've done all that you can, then that's what you can. But do all that you can. And for sure there will be times when that's going to include apologies. So here's part one in how not to apologize is tell them that you're sorry they were hurt or offended. Instead of being sorry for your words or actions or whatever that caused the hurt or offense. Uh, probably we've all seen this a hundred times. But look, look at how bad this is. This is so terrible. I'm sorry if you were hurt or offended by what I said. Absolutely awful. There are at least two major problems with this. Here's the first one is if. You're apologizing. There's no if. Someone was hurt or offended. You had to take out that if. Here's what the if there does, is that really you're, you're putting in a protective, insulating layer in between the apologizer and the offense. You're saying that, you know, I suppose under the hypothetically possible situation where maybe you were hurt or offended, then, then I don't know, well, I guess I'm sorry for that. Uh, and it, it really takes the offense from real to hypothetical and invalidates the experience of the person you're, you're apologizing to. Just take that out, and this is immediately so much better. You feel the difference between, I'm sorry if you were hurt or offended, versus I'm sorry that you were hurt or offended by what I said. Now, the hurt and the offense is acknowledged, and, and that's a reality, but this still isn't very good. Because if you really look at this and, and pick this apart, here's what you're apologizing for still is not what you did or said, but the other person's response or reaction, right? Like, I'm, um, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's, that's really not even something that you can apologize for. That's not even you. That's, that's them. And so this doesn't take responsibility for your piece in it. Here's a major, major piece of apologizing is just taking responsibility for and owning your part in whatever caused the offense. So how much better is this, to move simply to this, to I'm sorry that I hurt or offended you. I know some of you might look at this and see those three as being all almost the same. I'm telling you, these will be worlds apart in the ears of whomever you're apologizing to. And a major part of an apology is taking ownership and responsibility for whatever you did. And, and a good apology does that directly. I'm sorry that I hurt or offended you. And the next thing to not do in your apology is to be vague about what you're apologizing for. If you don't know legitimately, like you, someone has something against you and you're not even sure what it is, you're really not ready to apologize. You can't apologize for you don't even know what, so you got to work on th that, figure that out first. But listen, there's, here's what you want to avoid is, how terrible is this? Like, I'm sorry for I, whatever I did or said. Okay, that, that's awful. You want to be specific. Um, that's really, that's worse than no apology at all. Here's from Proverbs. This is the very last proverb in the series is people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess okay, and turn from them, they'll receive mercy. Okay? So just say exactly what happened, exactly what you did. That's confess. And then even this proverb from 3,000 years ago is saying that you're going to be very likely to receive a much more positive response. You're going to be receiving mercy at that point when you're specific about exactly what you did. I'm sorry that I borrowed your shirt without permission. I'm sorry that I lied to you about where I was last night. I'm sorry that I was late, uh, that, that I was loud so late into the night. Be specific about it. This is really just another part of taking responsibility and ownership for what happened. Now, this is also when you're going to be very, very tempted to make the mistake a mistake. Look, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Well, I, there can be times when that's the situation or when that's appropriate, but those are probably not going to be the, time, the times where you really need to have a really good apology. Because if you did math wrong and you undertipped a server, that's a mistake. Like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to undertip, I, I didn't carry the one, it, it, it was a mistake. When you gave directions and you mixed up your right and your left, you said, oh, I'm so sorry, I told you to turn right, you were supposed to turn left, I just got those turned around, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. Well, okay, but here's what we 
all know about mistakes is everybody makes mistakes and you're supposed to have some grace and some understanding for mistakes, right? So if you say, well, it's a mistake, really what that is, is you're kind of trying to say, look, don't be too mad. Like, I'm not such a bad person. It was, it was just a mistake. And you're concerned with yourself rather than the other person. Well, the moment you do that, you're going backwards and it's going to make things worse, not better. And so you'll notice that scripture does not really say a lot about mistakes, It doesn't say that our mistakes separate us from God. It does not say that the wages of our mistakes are death. It doesn't say that Jesus came from perfection in heaven to live on earth and then be brutalized, executed, die, and then resurrected to life so that that he could satisfy justice for the time that you forgot to carry the one on your tip or when you got your right and left mixed up when you were giving directions. If you did something wrong, say it was wrong. Don't call it a mistake. That's, that's so much softer and so much more kind of self-conscious and concerned with how you're going to come off. You say, I did it. It was wrong. Say it was wrong. Okay, and then you're going to want to make excuses or explain yourself. I'm sorry for borrowing your shirt. It was just, I didn't have anything that I really liked in my closet. I'm sorry that I lied about where I was last night. I didn't want you to be mad. I didn't want you to, to, to worry about me, you know, any sort of thing like that. What these do, again, is to demonstrate that your real intent is to manage how you come off and how you appear and that you're really not so bad. This is just kind of something that happened. But once again, the, the purpose of an apology is to be focused on the other person, not yourself. The moment it comes back to you, this is moving backwards. It's going to make things worse, not better. Just sort of a fun example that sticks with me on this was, uh, I've, looked, I've worked a lot of really strange jobs over the years, and I think it was about four years ago I was working for a home pet care service. And it was a small company, but we had any number of employees, including two, I guess, good friends. They were college-age girls, and they worked together, and they went on all their appointments together, I guess. Anyway, there was a family that hired us to feed and medicate their cat while they were on vacation. Very, very, very normal situation. Um, And this home apparently had a pool, and the two girls, I guess, jumped in the pool used the pool, and then apparently, if I remember right, the neighbors saw it, let them know, and so then they were furious. So our boss, the business owner, had these two girls call to apologize, which seemed very appropriate, and at least the way it got back to me, what they said was, yeah, I'm really sorry that we jumped in your pool, just neither of us have ever had a pool before. Well, then they got fired, because that's exactly the wrong way to handle something like this. Just say, it was wrong, I shouldn't have done it. Nobody wants to hear the excuses. Their purpose is to make you look better, not to have an apology. It's, it's going to make things worse, not better. Now, in the event, and this may or may not be the case, that the damage that was caused was really, truly unintentional, there may be an appropriate place to mention that, but it needs to be done a certain way and dodge certain things. It can't be at the beginning. The beginning is to express remorse and take responsibility for whatever it was and sets the tone for the whole thing. Now, you can then say something about, well, okay, listen, I I, I never intended it to hurt you if that is indeed the case, right? But that has to be at the beginning of a sentence that must end with, but I understand that I did. Um, My intention was never to hurt you, but I understand that I did. If you don't include that in the same sentence, then again, it comes off as, look, my intentions weren't so bad. Like, like, give me a little understanding. I wasn't trying to do anything bad, which again is, is focused on you and not them. Now, whatever it is, anything from you break your neighbor's window to you cheat on your spouse, that can be a little softer if they know it wasn't done to hurt them, right? That's a little softer than, like, I I didn't intend to hurt you. That's that's softer than, yeah, I broke your window. It's because I was mad that you don't keep your weeds down. Or, yeah, I cheated on you because I was mad that you're so controlling all the time. Well, that's worse, okay? If that's the case, then you just skip over that completely and you say, I did it. It was wrong. I hurt you. I'm sorry. But you can include... It was never intended to, to have this effect, but I know it did, if in fact that's the case. The next thing is to ignore the possibility of repeat. 
you drank all your roommate's milk, you thought it was yours, you were wrong, they're mad, I'm sorry. Um, okay, good, I, is it going to happen again? I don't know, I'm apologizing, not prophesying. You, gotta, you're, you oversleep and you're late for a meeting, your boss is furious, oh, I'm so sorry, it won't happen again. Okay, good, why not? Well, I just said, I'm so sorry. It's not good enough. If, if there are steps that can be taken to ensure that it doesn't happen again, you're going to want to let the person know that you're taking those steps. They're going to receive that both as good news for the future and as evidence that your apology really is genuine. So I'm sorry I drank all your milk. From now on, I'm going to mark my initials on mine. And so if I don't see those, I know that it's not mine and I won't drink it. I'm sorry I was late for the meeting. From now on, I'm setting a second and third alarm on the other side of my room. So if the first alarm doesn't do the job, then I'm still going to be there and on time for the meeting. And, and remember, if you go back to the proverb that we saw, it says, confess and turn from your sins, and then you receive mercy. So if, you're re- if your apology really is genuine, you're taking some steps to see that this won't happen again, and that's going to be tremendous evidence that there's really not just a sorrow, but a turning from, and that's going to be met with, with a much better response than otherwise. And then finally, and this may or may not apply, but if it's something that can be compensated for, you let them know what you're doing to compensate. I, I drank all your milk, I'm getting you a whole fresh new carton. I broke the window, I'm responsible for paying for the replacement. Now, most of the things that are most devastating to the people around us and that require the most thought out, most intentional apologies, part of the reason they're devastating is because they're usually things that really can't be made right. They're really things that can't be compensated for. But in the event that it's something that can, then you'll want to include that. Now, I just said finally, but the message isn't quite that short. Uh, Some of you are sitting here thinking, Ross, you have left one very, very important element on the table here. What about the other person's piece in all this? We haven't mentioned anything about that, because you know what? I I did mess up. I kind of was a jerk. But honestly, they're the ones who started it. They're the ones who escalated it until finally it just so happened that I snapped. What about that? What about, like, can they just take a joke? Can they lighten up a little bit? How about, um, you know, whatever it is. There are a thousand nuances and specifics that color every situation. All of life is complicated. We know. We haven't mentioned any of those. Do you know why that is? very simply boils down to this, makes things worse, not better. The purpose of the apology is to focus on everyone. If you're still trying to be concerned with how you're coming off, you're not ready to apologize, that's going to be probably worse than no apology at all. Remember the verse from Romans that we looked at, do everything that you can, as much as it depends on you, Right? You're not worried about whatever their piece is. That's for them to worry about. That's, you, that's their responsibility. But you're responsible for your own self. And you need to focus on that. And here's the good news, you guys, is when you do, when that you come with a really good, heartfelt apology, about 90% of the time, the worst that you will be met with is something like, okay, well, thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate that. And most of the time, you're probably going to receive some sort of a reciprocal apology from the other person. A good apology is so disarming. It's possible, but you almost would have to try to still be mad and then kick the person and pile on after a really good apology that does these simple things. Okay? And, and most of the time, it's going to be, you know what, honestly, I, I know I've been hard on you. I, I'm not even mad at you. I'm just mad that you got the promotion that I wanted. Or, you know, look, I've, I know I've, I've been hard to deal with lately. It's, it, it's at least half my fault. I'll, I'll try and do better. And you're going to receive mercy if you just take responsibility and focus on that. We all, you guys, every one of us, we all find our peace in all sorts of things that end up making an apology necessary. That's all of us. That's everybody. And sometimes the damage can't be undone. But here's what we can always do. 
is the right thing from wherever we are. And so when we do that, you're going to find yourself in a good situation most of the time. So here is how not to apologize. None of you will make all these mistakes in the same place if you're over about age eight. But I'm sorry if you were offended by whatever I said or did. I, I didn't mean to. It's just I'm really tired. I got upset. I made a mistake. Okay, plus, it's not like you're perfect either. You've done the same thing 12 times. I just did it once. Now you're all mad, but sorry. Okay. You, you would all do better than that before you hear a message. Okay. But you, the, the number of mistakes in there, they're, they're tough to dodge them all. But let's take that. Okay, and now we can flip that into something like this. I'm really sorry for the hurt that I caused you by the way I spoke on Tuesday. What I said was thoughtless, rude, and wrong. My intent was to be funny and not to hurt you, but I know that the result was that you felt disparaged and made fun of in front of others. I promise I'm going to be much more mindful of how I speak in the future. And I can't take back what I said, but I have reached out to everybody who was there to let them know that I shouldn't have said what I did. And here is the bottom line, a spiritual reality behind all of this, is obviously we want to minimize our sinfulness okay, and, and our wrongdoing and our offenses and even our very, very, maybe sometimes well-intentioned, just honest misunderstandings that result in things getting messed up. Okay? But the reality is, it's going to happen. It's going to be us. It's going to be you. It's going to be me. And so when that happens, we want to be able to apologize in, it's a little bit ironic that I, that I say this, but to apologize in the most Christ-like manner possible. And that's weird, right? Because I don't know if Jesus ever did apologize, but I know that he's the only person who's ever lived who wouldn't have had to. But even when we put ourselves in a situation that Jesus never would have put himself into, here's what we can do is the right thing from there. We can still apologize in the most Christ-like way possible. So my first choice for us as followers of Jesus, probably your first choice too, is that we, even not just life point crossing, followers of Jesus all over the globe, is that we would be known as the people who never ever under any circumstance say or do the wrong thing. We never hurt anybody. We never damage anybody's emotions or psyche or property. We never have anything at all to apologize for under any circumstance. That's not reality. That's why we're here following Jesus in the first place. But here's what we can do, is we can be the people who do the right thing from wherever we are. If you're in the middle of a mess, okay, you can be the person who follows Jesus and does the right thing from the middle of the mess. When we, we acknowledge our sin and our failures, we don't make excuses or rationalizations, and we keep the focus on the other person and who they are rather than being concerned about ourselves and how we look or, or seem or come off, you will probably not be able to live at 100% peace with 100% of the people 100% of the time. It's a little idealistic. But you can take responsibility for 100% of what we do, and messages like this and, and kind of series like this, here's, this is, these are just small pieces of progress toward that goal. So that's how not to have a conversation. You get a new series starting next week, which is going to be actually all about asking and answering the question of, you know, the God of reality. Is he kind of just like the God we're stuck with, and, and I might even have to kind of apologize for sometimes? Or is he really much closer to exactly the God who we would hope for and maybe even our, his critics would also if they saw things through just a little bit of a different lens and a different filter. Now that's, that's interesting. So we'll see you next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. 
that you are the God of second chances and third chances and 70 times seven chances. And that despite and through our sinfulness, that you offer us forgiveness. Even when our, when our apologies are terrible, when our confessions are weak and sinful, even in our confessions, that we receive the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Father, may we be people who we seek and offer that same grace and mercy to others that we've received from you. And still praying, if you're here, and maybe you've never taken that first step to connect with God through Jesus Christ, maybe, maybe the last thing you needed to hear was a message about apologies because all you see in your life is your own sinfulness and shortcomings and the things that you've done wrong. Here's what that makes you is a perfect candidate for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And that can be yours right here, right now, today. If you're here with us in person, if you're watching online, whatever your situation is, you know that there have been things you have done wrong. God, as a perfect, holy, and righteous God and judge, of course, would have to see that justice is done for your sinfulness, but that's why Jesus came, lived a sinless life, and his death on the cross was him satisfying justice for your sinfulness so that you could receive his righteousness. He would would receive your sinfulness and you would be adopted as a child of God and his family forever. If that's you, just right where you sit, you can talk to God, say it out loud, even in your heart, and he'll hear you. Say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and was resurrected so that I could be forgiven and be adopted as a child in your family. Please come into my life. Forgive me and adopt me begin to make me into the person who you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. And we just prayed a prayer like that for the first time. It's not the words or the prayer that saves us that you put your faith in Jesus. God's grace comes to you through that. You are forgiven in a new spiritual creation. The greatest thing that you can do from here is to do this in some community. You're not intended to live the life of following Jesus by yourself. If you're here in person, just go out to the point as just the corner in the lobby. Tell the person there the decision that you've made. They'll take your information. We'll be able to follow up with you. If you're watching online, send us a message. Let us know. And you will. we, we want to just get you started with some wonderful, positive, healthy steps toward the new life that God has for you. And for the rest of us, uh, I, I don't know if any you know who here maybe has something that maybe there's been something in your life waiting for an apology. Maybe this is something that it just kind of gets packed away for a, a different kind of rainy day. But here's what we can do: wherever you are, whatever your situation is, commit between yourself and the Spirit of God that we will be the people who do the right things in the mess, that when there's a mess, we will behave in as Christ-like of a manner as possible. We will have concern for the other person rather than how we look in humility and in imitation of Jesus Christ himself. We commit right now between your, yourself and the Spirit of God that that is who you will be, that you will cooperate with his Spirit as he makes you into more of that. And Father, we're so grateful for the opportunities that you give us to live and to grow and to become the people you've created us to be. We ask that your spirit would give each one of us here the strength and the power and the follow through to make these Sunday morning life changes into a real Monday through Saturday transformation in our lives and the lives of the people around us. In the name of Jesus Christ.